a community pulls together in wanting to see peace and love and grace. A community believes in the same facet, especially if they're all reading out of the same Bible, which is the King James Version Bible in this Bible, Bible Belt area. Now they can pick, they can poke, they can make fun of me because, well, he's an uneducated man. Well, he was abused in growing up because he had a World War II drill sergeant for a father. Well, he got involved in this. Well, he got involved in that. They can ridicule, dehumanize me all they want. But the fact of the matter is, I'm still standing on 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 3255. And I'm going to continue to stand on 291 Thompson Road until either heaven breaks loose and God takes his children out of this hell hole, or they, or they, or they, Take them into their ways and admit that what they have tried to do here in Weekly County was not only unlawful, but it was wrong. And right now I'm talking about Chief Moore that was a police up here in Martin, Tennessee, and the mayor, Randy Brundridge, and other law enforcement agencies around here that know the truth towards what went on. Various people in this neighborhood know the truth towards how that they was trying to rattle us down here on our own property. How that they took my own brother, David Jeffrey Jackson, and stuck a gun, his own firearm, to his own head and tried to take his own life and then lied about it. They should have got 15 years imprisonment for attempt to murder. My father, James Robert Jackson, the one that had the problem coming from the military, should have got 15 years whenever I went to Kenton, Tennessee, and I told them that this maniac had just got through attacking me, and I still had 64 staples pulling my skin together because I'd recently had a car roll over on top of me. And I had a doctor cut into me that gave me a nine-unit blood transfusion and removed my spleen and my appendix while he was in there. The people in Kenton, Tennessee, still has yet to own up to any wrongdoing pertaining to their mayor, Damien Cross. These little redneck backwoods law enforcement people are using methods similar towards the very thing that we're listening to right now pertaining to a 41-day standoff that happened in 2016 that almost fit similarities of what went on with the Waco standoff towards what went on in Mount Karma in 1993 pertaining to how law enforcement Thanks to their almighty. Thanks that they can come in and strong arm and muscle people off their own property and allow for others to dictate and try to dominate their lives and torment their lives the way that David in my life was tormented because of these barbarians around here. And I don't mean that lightly. I mean barbarians. Nothing more than drug users, drug takers, and alcoholics. People that need to be reformed by the Holy Spirit and need Jesus. The real Jesus, not the so-called Jesus. Not the superstar Jesus, but the real Jesus. Each vehicle would leave for safety reasons, 10 to 15 minute intervals, so they wouldn't be close together. The family had left 
and the oldest daughter who had just I want to back this up and and reprogram this of what has went on here to leave and to escort him out of the state and there was there was a lot of different components uh, things going on behind the scenes there the the federal side of the house was more on board with you know resolving the situation so no charges had been filed filed federally rather than charging these people locally and keeping them here if we could resolve the situation by getting them to leave and go. you know why they didn't want to do that because they would then they would tie them up in their courts and then they would have to remain in their county so it would be a double jeopardy for the law if they done that so now they're going to try to wiggle and work out towards working out another deal oh let's try to do it this way instead of this way because our strong arm tactics isn't working go home and let them work it out through the legal system. Yeah, I'm sure there was going to be some consequences, but nowhere near the level of consequences that they face after a 41-day standoff. I want to help you guys get out of here. I'll get you a safe escort See, I'm out. Getting, I'm getting, we're getting ignored again, Sheriff. Sheriff. I didn't come to argue. I just came to offer Not you guys a peaceful resolution. Okay. So. I appreciate it. Once they rejected that offer and said, we're staying here, I knew that they were going to force us to deal with them. Giving in to an armed criminal takeover, well, it's just not going to work. There came a point where people had... Okay, it was armed, but why did it have to become criminal? Because these people had their rights pertaining to grazing rights. You see how the law twists things around in their favor? the same way that the Oklahoma authorities has twisted it around towards it just being a truck bomb and they're not telling the truth about what was actually in the lower corridor of that building that had to have been placed there that was part of that Timothy McVeigh and Nichols movement or it was put there because it was going to be used upon to the Davidians, and just so happens the people that put it there wasn't smart enough to get it out, and it turned into something lethal, of it either being C4 or dynamite. One of the two had to have happened. It was either an inside job corresponding with the Ryder truck, Timothy McVeigh and Nichols, or somebody had planted some explosions in that building that wasn't supposed to have been confined in that building. Because you do not confine explosions in a federal building. They've got facilities to where you put stuff like that in coolers and it's enclosed in a capsule or it's enclosed in areas that is regulated that way, if there ever was an accident, it wouldn't be such of an accident. You don't put stuff like that around people. Not the general public. To be taken into custody. January 26, 20 and 16. Lavoie and everybody, we're going into the next county to talk about the Constitution and how they could take their grazing rights back. They've been free to pass from the refuge and into town. We were getting things prepared and we had a cute family there that had arrived a couple days earlier. You keep in mind, these was law, these was, these citizens was law abiding citizens. Because you can't be doing what they're doing if you are not a legal citizen to be carrying a firearm. So everybody that the federal system was dealing with at this point in time was law-abiding citizens. Yes, they was toting guns. 
but they had a right to tote guns to protect their own benefit. A few days earlier, the Sharp family, they were there to sing, and they had decided they were going to go with them to this meeting and put on one of their concerts because it just touches your heart itself. They're just awesome. I heard about this protest that was happening in Oregon involving the Bundy family, and I knew the Bundy family from the 2014 standoff. So I called Ryan and I was like, what's going on up there in Oregon? He told me what they were doing and how, why they were protesting. And my mom and I talked about it and she decided she was going. We were a singing family. And that was a big part of our lives, especially when we went to the Bundy Ranch. Our biggest reason for going there was to sing to everybody. And when we went to Oregon, my mom's purpose for bringing the children there was to sing to the people and sing to the FBI. and and um, just try to bring some peace and bring some happiness to a situation that was uh, a little bit scary. Stability, bring stability to that Each vehicle would situation. be, for safety reasons, 10 to 15 minute intervals, so they wouldn't be close together. The family had left, and the oldest daughter, who had just arrived the day before, wasn't ready. I was supposed to be leaving with my family, and I was not ready to go, so I stayed behind, and I was gonna leave with the next group that was leaving at 3.30, which would be the, the Bundys and Lavoie Finnegan. We left in Lavoie's truck, and it was about a two-hour drive for us. Minding their own business. It was cold outside, the road snowy and icy. The Jeep behind us was supposed to be coming 10 to 15 minutes behind us. Snow on they the ground. They came directly behind us. Cold and for outside. them to be right on our tail was really not what was supposed to happen. Then... The boy up in the front noticed this bunch of vehicles and there was an angled road there. There was a whole bunch of these SUVs and vehicles lined up. What is that? What's going on? And I turned around and I could see all these vehicles that were coming up. All of a sudden it was like a wake-up call. We've been set up. They're entrapped. It's an entrapment. Now they've got the road blocked. They're on a major state road where the road itself is cleared, but there's still snow on the ground on both sides of the road. There's a whole family in this SU in this truck. I almost called it an SUV, but it's a looks to be a Dodge white truck, the whole family. And of course they've got them in crosshairs right now towards SWAT that has basically pulled them over that is strong arming them in this situation. So we just saw vehicles coming up behind us. We could hear their sirens and see their lights um, and we could see them pull the Jeep over. And the boy kept saying, we've got to get to the sheriff, we've got to get to the sheriff. And that's in Grant County. But we knew that he would protect us. They started shouting to turn the vehicle off and put your hands out the window. And Lavoy didn't turn the vehicle off, but he put his hands out the window in his head. And he said, are, are you police? He said, we're going to the next county to talk to the sheriff. I'm going to meet the sheriff. The sheriff is waiting for us. So you do as you damn well please. But I'm not going anywhere. Here I am, right there. Right there, put a bullet through it. You understand? I'm going to go meet the sheriff. You back down or you kill me now. Go ahead, put the bullet through me. I can see on top of his hat is a red laser. I'm worried that he's gonna, they're going to shoot him. All right, send the woman out now. Look for well, I'm going to ask them if they want to go out. I was like, okay, I'm not getting out of the vehicle. I was afraid that I'd be shot if I moved too fast or if anybody did anything. Victoria says, I'm not getting out. Then I'm not getting out either. I'm not turning over. I'm going into Dade County. Well, I'm going if, into Grant County to see the sheriff. Well, if we duck and you drive, 
What are they going to do? Try to knock us out? Yeah. Well, brother, we got to go. we got about 50 at miles. We should yeah. never have stopped. I'm going to keep going. Then we have to duck. I know. We're with Ryan. If we take you off, get Ryan right back. Shoot your tires out. Now, at this point, they're talking nonsense because, by law, you're supposed to render to the law as far as them going further and not stopping. So things is starting to get out of hand at this point after this this uh, siege on the road on a state highway is occurring. You'll hear what actually happens that basically turns into a bloodbath simply because of a bunch of law enforcement agents that had itchy fingers and had already hyped themselves up that this group of people was dangerous and lethal even though they was on their way to the sheriff's department to try to resolve this in a different way rather than them all packing up and leaving the county like a bunch of whip dogs with their tails tucked in between their legs. They was not opposing any type of threat at this point in time by driving down the road on the way to the sheriff's department and the guy repeated that several different times to the authorities in this siege. This was a shakedown that now is fixing to turn into a bloodbath. Please listen. Okay, Ryan Hammond. Where's, where? Why did they pull you over? There's no service here. Just because. Are you ready? Well, where's those amp? Where's the gun? The gun stopped. You can't get around it. Okay. I'm going to go. Are you guys ready? Okay, get, get down. Then you duck down. Give me that camera. Okay, give me this camera. Go. Okay, you ready? Okay, give me that camera. Go. Now they're leaving. So now they are intentionally evading the law. And because of that, now the law has an upper hand on them. That's what has occurred here. And I looked out and I could see one vehicle behind us uh, pursuing. Keep going. Hey, what about I'm one of those guys? Hey, can we can't get around him. I'm going to go get help. Okay. And then all of a sudden uh, he said something about a roadblock. Now they got another roadblock up the road. They've got two choices. Either stop or try to avoid the roadblock by going off the road into the snow in their attempts towards evading the law. So at this point in time, they are breaking the law. Hang on. Okay, they're shooting. Hang on. Okay, here. Go ahead and shoot me. Shoot him. Stay down. Stay down. Stay down. Stay down. Stay down. Shoot me. Shoot me. Are they shooting him? The guy was standing outside the vehicle. He did not have any type of weapon in his hand. He had both his hands up in the air saying, go ahead and shoot me, go ahead and shoot me. And guess what? They just shot him. Did they shoot him? You asshole. Oh my God! I just hear a bunch of shots all at once and he fell. I started shouting that I was an EMT. I was trying to get up, trying to get out. Is he dead? Stop it out. I'm an EMT! I'm an EMT! Uh, are you hit? No, I am! Stay out! Help me! No, hold on, hold on, don't shoot me! Don't do Don't do anything! Don't do anything. <laughs> now the, the police officers are shooting into the automobile while everybody is ducked down trying to protect their own lives. Who the hell is LaVoy? I can't see. No, Shut up! Stay down! Oh, God! Stay down! Oh. Stay down. So 
now you're looking at a slaughter situation to where the law enforcement is abusing their authorities by basically slaughtering these people out in broad daylight off of a state road of the ground being covered in snow. They've done already shot the, the driver. Uh, he's laying in the snow right now bleeding, uh, unconscious. Um, these people was on their way to the sheriff's department and now this has turned into this type of a scrimmage. They're still shooting into the truck or the SUV. Um, even though there is no guns being seen, there's no guns being shooting at them, they're still constantly shooting into this truck. They've done blow the windows out. Um, it's just awful. They didn't want us to get out, whoever was shooting at us. It's turned into a slaughter match. Kill them was probably their memento at this point in time, coming from law enforcement. Then the next thing we knew, this blue smoke stuff started coming from the front uh, um, seats towards us, and it hit my nose, and I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was choking. Keep going. Oh, shit. Stop! Please! Stop! Please. Stop! That's ridiculous. Because you're stupid. I can kill all of us. Now they're having to breathe tear gas. Don't get up. No, don't get up. God. Okay, uh, okay, they, they, got, they got lasers still on us. They got lasers still on us. Lavoy got out. I think they've killed Lavoy. <coughs> they just shot gas rounds into the car. <coughs> We're puckered down in here trying not to be shot. <laughs> right then, I think was the scariest moment for me because I thought that we were all going to die. I thought about my family and I thought about the things that mattered in life to me, and I just thought we were all going to die. This location? I surrender! Can we just surrender? Out, I'm out of the left side door! Bunch of maniacs. Uncivil unrest. Because it could have been handled in a much more civilized way. Once more, these people was going to the sheriff and had told the law enforcement that they was going to this particular sheriff. But see, they didn't want them to go to this sheriff because the sheriff was actually on their side. And that's what they didn't want. We wasn't going to have that. Okay, I don't know. Okay, let's get up. Okay! That's you. Run. I don't know if you can get up. You get up first. Let her in first. Let her out first. You go first. You go first. You don't kill me! I started shouting, we surrender, we surrender. And I finally heard someone shout back, send out the mail first. So Ryan got out and while I was standing there, they said, stay right there, stay with your hands where we can see them. And I could see Lavoy laying in the snow and I could just tell that he was dead. I could see men in camouflage and in black standing between the trees. And it seemed like so many of them. They yell at me to come, and I'm getting out of the car with your hands up, of course. They're all dressed in military gear or whatever, these green outfits, and they, ha and they are like snipers. They have all these long guns, all these guns. They have all these rifles. Victoria and I were yelling at the men. You guys are all part of murder. You just murdered a man in cold blood. She says, I almost died today. And I said, yeah, Victoria, you're 18 years old. And you're going to remember this moment for the rest of your life. I don't know. A lot of people tell me that that um, I shouldn't have been through that at, at that age. Tuesday morning. I called him to talk to him about what I was going to be doing that day. He said he was really busy, that he had interviews lined up with John. That was the last time I talked to him. I'd gone into Fredonia 
with my daughter for her game about 1.30 and his parents were there and his brother was there and my son was there and we were all there. All of a sudden somebody came up to me and said, there's been something that's happened. And she was hysterical and she was screaming and crying that the boy had been killed. And it was just unreal. It was not real. Somebody had gone into the gym and told the officials what was going on and they stopped the game and they brought my family into the hallway and we uh, told them what was going on and we, they gave us privacy for a while until we could get ourselves together enough to go over to the local police station and try to get more information and confirmation and make because we were still trying we were still holding out hope that it wasn't Lavoy and that was a nightmare in itself just going over there and making those phone calls to people who were just heartless on the other end and would just push forward or the hold button or transfer me to another agency or transfer me multiple different times and then just put me on an answering machine without answering and whether or not it was Lavoy. I thought how could people be so unkind but and then I, that town had been through so much with the different groups that had come into their town and the FBI and the Sheriff's Department escalating fear that they were just probably glad that it was over. To leave the vehicle as quick as he did in Shauna's video just confirms that he was indeed trying to move the threat away from those in the truck. The 18 year old Victoria Sharp is the same age as our daughter, our youngest daughter, and I know he was worried for Ryan and Shauna as well. Those people were victims. Um, and were being shot at multiple times without ever exhibiting any threat to any of those officers. <clears throat> and any I believe threat. that he was murdered. Any threat to any of those officers. Any threat. I can't imagine anything that could be bad enough that would be made better by the death of a man like Lavoie Fenicum. But then I hear my husband tell me that he's scared to death in prison. And so I don't know everything. He was shot in the back without a gun in his hand. Whether he was reaching for one or not, he never pulled a gun out of his hand. I think they... He had both his hands in the air. Both his arms was above his head. There was no way that he was reaching for any type of weapon because it was all on film and 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 it just showed it. How that they gunned him down like a dirty dog. He was nothing but a massacre. A mere pure massacre. I expected to shoot someone that day. I mean they shot at the vehicle before he got out. They shot at all of us really. Then he got out and he definitely drew their attention away from us. His whole conviction was to protect us. And I know that he was running away from the vehicle so that he would draw the fire and they wouldn't fire upon us. But they still fired upon to him anyway. After they killed him, it was as if that they was wanting to kill everybody. Nothing but pure, mere madness happened here. January the 26th, 2016. A person murdered in cold blood. 
by the authorities. I don't think that he was murdered. Lavoie reached toward his pocket, uh, if I remember correctly, at least three times. He had his hands over his head. They just showed it on TV, the actual killing that happened. I had an investigation done and an autopsy done myself. I picked up his body. I took it to the medical examiner. So I know that he was shot in the back three times. And I know that those exit wounds came and exited on the left side. And that is where he is reaching each time. But his hands go back up in the air multiple times as he reaches for a shot. He goes back up and his hand is empty again. Right. Whenever you're hit by a bullet, your natural instinct is for your hand to reach down where you was just hit. No gun. No gun was ever in the man's hand. They shot him down like a dog. He did not go for a weapon, or he would have had the weapon in his hand. It's really hard to separate all the factors that led to a tragic death. The only thing that they could have justifiably got him on was resisting to comply with the police officers after they had originally pulled him over the first time and then he decided to leave and pursue towards the sheriff's office. That was the only thing that they could have got him on as far as a violation. Why they was doing this, they was haunting, taunting, stalking this family. And they was purposely ambushed and shot down like a bunch of dirty dogs. This, my friends, is what we have that we call protection. These are law enforcement agencies that's protecting the people. No, they're protecting certain groups of people. And if you're a troublemaker, like this guy was looked upon. If you're a troublemaker, like I'm looked upon. See, they look upon to me like I'm a rebel riser. Because I've made my stand here at 291 Thompson Road. But the thing about it is, this isn't something that I just started yesterday pertaining to my message going out before the people. They don't like the message. So because they don't like the message, they have attacked the messenger, which is myself. This family was under attack. And we was under attack by not being properly taken care of by the authorities in this county. And if you don't believe me, you can make a telephone call to the Sheriff's Department and you can see how many telephone calls was made from 20 and 14 up to 20 and 17, which was a three-year period, and I guarantee you the amount of telephone calls that was made to the sheriff's office, I'm going to say at least 100 times, and that's being conservative with my numbers. There was at least a hundred different attempts in a three-year period of asking for help. S-O-S, S-O-S, S-O-S. Help, help, help. Because the situation was unbearable out here. And the type of help that I got was basically the same type of help that I got whenever I went to Kenton, Tennessee in O'Bion County after my father had attacked me towards trying to get help over there with Damian Cross and Don Curry and the rest of the law enforcement agencies over there in Kenton, Tennessee. Basically got the same type of help, which I didn't get no help. All I got was branded as being a lunatic and the person that should have been 
branded as a lunatic was the lunatic that attacked me with 64 staples up and down my belly because you do not attack somebody, a patient, that had just got through having nine units of blood. You do not attack somebody that was in the better interest of children across the road. They got so frustrated here in Weekly County because they couldn't control the situation because they was on the wrong side. So they decided to attack the person that was giving out the telephone calls. The very person that kept calling for three consecutive years, over a hundred calls either coming from myself or my brother up until he died. Help us, help us, help us. We need help out here. We're being attacked by the community, by various people out here. Once they become so frustrated, rather than them actually seizing to the, pro to the problem, they attacked the people that was crying out for the help. Imagine that. So now, I get victimized twice from the year 20 and 14 to up until the year 20 and 17. I get victimized by the demons that's coming around here wanting to get in a pissing contest because they didn't like it because I come back here. And now I get victimized by the law because the law didn't do their job pertaining to Tommy Moore and the judicial system in Dresden, Tennessee, in Weekly County. And that's in addition to the case that happened prior to that, which at that time would have been about 10 years in 2005 towards what happened up here in Martin, Tennessee. They act like that I'm not supposed to remember these things. They act like that I'm not supposed to hold them accountable for these things. But yet now they want to hold me accountable. They want to keep a chart list on me. That way I become a habitual offender. It's one of these standards towards do as I say and not as I do. They're full of hypocrisy. Tommy Moore, Judge Pence, the judicial system in this country, the judicial system in this county, the judicial system in this country is corrupt and full of hypocrisy because they teach, they tell people what to do, but then they themselves break the laws in doing what that they do towards using the tactics that they use against their own people. And this is what we elected them to do? After crying out SOS over a hundred times in a three-year period? And God only knows at the police officers that come out here during that time. It had to have been. In a three year period. It had to be over 300 officers that come out here. In a three year period. For one reason or another. It had to have been. At least 300. Once more, that's a conservative number of how many trips was, was brought out here to 291 Thompson Road or to 430 Beach Grove Road, Sharon, Tennessee. And us constantly crying out, help, help, help. We need help. SOS. And the type of help that I got was I had to admit to a felony that I was stalking a family across the road because I was trying to protect the children. Now, how messed up is that? That's the same thing as what you just got through listening to pertaining to this 41-day standoff. Pull over an individual and gun him down. And every time he got hit in the side, naturally his arm would flinch towards the, towards the pain. And every time he done that, they initiated and said he was reaching for a gun. Why his hands was over his head and he never had a never had a weapon in his hand. The man was not in any type of threatful situation 
All they had to do was take control of that situation and tell that individual, please lay down on the ground. Get on the bed, get on your belly, even though it was snow on the ground. Please lay down on the ground. That was handled unprofessionally the same way as the situation was handled unprofessionally in Mount Karma outside of Waco or in Ruby Ridge. Or with Richard Jewell of the individual that found the bomb in the oak in the uh, Atlanta Olympics. Tell me that mistakes isn't constantly being made pertaining to these judicial law enforcement agencies that we the people have hired to protect us and take care of us. But yet no, we can't get nobody to stick together. So sad. So, so sad. At the end of the day, Lavoy Finnicum was the one who had the last best opportunity to prevent violence. Had he complied with the orders of the officers, like everyone else in that vehicle, he would be alive today. And unfortunately that was life lost through the course of this, but I still believe that they found the most peaceful resolution they could. I had asked these folks to go home. It's been said many times uh, that you could have taken them into custody here or here or here. There were a lot of opportunities, yes, but no safe opportunities to take somebody into custody after statements had been made that they weren't willing to be taken into custody. If there was a failure somewhere in trying to resolve this, it would be that loss of life. That in actual reality, them people don't a bit more give a damn about than a man on the moon. They're probably glad the individual got killed because they looked at him once more towards him being a rebel riser. The same way as they look at me. But yet now I preach a message of love and grace and peace. But yet now I have no followers. I have not a congregation. A Joe Osteen, 40, 50,000 congregation. I have no members that supports the Windmill Ministries openly. Talk about a bunch of two-faced, cowardly hypocrites. Yellow belly, cowardly hypocrites. That is exactly what has put us in the position that we're in right here in America towards us being $23 trillion in debt and growing daily. Over 2.3 million incarcerated prisoners. Uh-huh. The click wanted to protect the click, but the click didn't care about the rest of us. And now, the wrath of God has befallen upon the all of us because the one bad apple spoiled the rest of the bunch. And until the people wake up, it's like I said, if this coronavirus don't do it, God's got a million other zillion different things that he can bring upon to society in some form or fashion that will bring us to our knees. This message is supposed to be a message to be brought forth before the people. Regardless whether you like the messenger, or you love the messenger, or you hate the messenger, it doesn't matter. The message was selected by the main messenger, which is God, that selected me to be the mouthpiece for him, a representative for him. And the rest of these people around here can go straight to hell. Including the Neals and including that bunch over there in Kenton, Tennessee that started all this 30 plus years ago. That has put us where we are now. For in the last days, the Bible says, 
we will be living in perilous times. The word perilous means dangerous. These are the people that's going to be held accountable, including Tommy Moore, including the law enforcement agencies, including uh, Mr. Moore up in Martin, Tennessee, that used to be the chief of police over there in the Martin PD, including Randy Brundridge, including these preachers, including these so-called deacons that has put us where we are right here in 2020. April, what is this? The 25th, 23rd, 20 something, 23rd, 24th of April. Sad. Very sad. When you look at it, it's tough. You're watching, in my opinion, the assassination of an American. Exactly. I walked that site. Having military background, I know what an L ambush is. They had put their vehicles in a blocking position and they had set up along one side of it, the high ground, they had actually cut the tree branches so they're about four to six inches to use as rifle rests. If you went 150 feet past that corner, there was a three quarter mile straight away. It had sloping sides and was snow covered. You could have spike stripped it, let him drive down, his tires would have flattened, and he had no place to go. Right. I understand there are criminals, but an American that wants to take care of his family, has Christian values, has strong integrity and morals, is shot with his hands up because the FBI team lead amped up his people that he was an enemy? Right. Something seriously fucking wrong in this country. Exactly. Just like they done David Koresh. They could have arrested David Koresh and that Waco Mount Karma compound at any given time. He was constantly leaving the compound. Going to Lowe's, going to grocery stores, getting supplies. But rather than doing it in a peaceful, settled way, they wanted to showboat it. They wanted to beat their chest like a bunch of apes and come in like a bunch of wild heathens that started that 51-day standoff versus this 41-day standoff. Now, what is wrong with this picture that keeps occurring again and again and again? It's got to do with the tactics of law enforcement, and it's got to do with the ill will of our judicial system that is no longer operating in the way that our ancestors and our forefathers and the builders of this country intended for it to operate. Just like whenever they get up there in the White House and they haggle over a bill, Knowing good and well that society right now needs help towards stimulus packages. And it takes them forever and a day to finally pass something. And then after they pass it, they still can't get it right towards the money being equally put out the way that it's supposed to be put out. You talk about the left arm not knowing what the right hand is doing. And the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. That's exactly what's been going on in America for the past 30 plus years. Good luck to all of us. Good luck to each and every one of us, especially those who are trying to live a righteous lifestyle. After Mr. Finnegan lost his life, we were able to get a blockade. And what that is is just one more armed element you have to go through. Usually, as in most military operations, when the leadership's gone, the rest of the thing falls apart. Proved to be true. Over the next, what, 24, 48 hours, everybody scattered uh, to the wind, with the exception of the four that were left at the end. And I never did understand what their point was. David Fry, Jeff Banta, and Sean and Sandy Anderson are the last four remaining at the refuge, 40 days after armed protesters took it over. 
The FBI, local and state police cleared out after a standoff with the now here National Wildlife Refuge came to an end. About 9.40 this morning, three occupiers surrendered to police and were taken into custody. A fourth, the final protester, refused to leave, but supporters, including evangelist Franklin Graham and a Nevada lawmaker, convinced him to surrender, and he did, after a simple request. He ate a cookie, asked everyone to say hallelujah. When they said hallelujah, he came out. You know, they say that there was an armed standoff in Harney County. That is a total, total bullshit lie. There were people that were exercising their Second Amendment rights. There were people that were on guard, but none of those people ever pointed their guns at anybody. him. I miss him a great deal. I'm learning to do everything that he used to do. When you are a married couple, you're a team and you each have your own little areas of responsibility and you uh, count on each other. Was I angry at the Bundys? Oh no. I've only caught myself being angry a couple of times and I've quickly brought that into check. I know that what he did he believed in and I see him as a hero not a martyr I forgive those who have killed him I usually get a call every night or every other night mostly just for him to know that I'm okay and he tells me that he doesn't feel safe what's left They've given up their right to appeal. So the only thing left is to ask for the president for executive clemency, to actually look at the case and, and see whether he thinks it's fair and whether he thinks what they did deserves five years in prison and asking for mercy. I keep hoping that there's some commutation or clemency or pardon or something that there's somebody out there somewhere that can understand what a travesty our federal government is. These were my brothers and my friends. They're locked up, and one of them's dead. If Bundy had had his act together, he wouldn't have allowed the militia anywhere close to him. He'd have done an occupation for a period of time and left. And today the law would be on trial. The regulation, all that stuff would be on trial as opposed to him being on trial. What's happening to these cultures? They're being murdered. Ranchers are worried about coming up. They don't want to become the target of the bureaucrats. Martin Luther King got it right. He did peaceful demonstrations, sit-ins, walked across bridges. Bundy did it with firearms. I want to make something clear here. We will see other standoffs. The overall majority of this movement is peaceful, but there are extremely dangerous threads which, when the time comes, will yield towards confrontation as opposed to reason. Pretty tough to feel American when your own government has a vendetta against you. Yes. I still love this country. And I wish we could fix it.
luck to all of us in these chain of events that we have seen unfold again and again and again just within the past 30 years until we are willing to come together as a Christian entity as a Christian society of realizing that these br brutal harsh tactics that various law enforcement agencies are using and has used is not only unethical, unmoral, but they're illegal. And these are the people that should be held in trial. These are the people that should go before the courts and should be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law towards dereliction of duty and overextending their powers just as they done in the Waco siege 32 years ago whenever a bunch of ATF agents decided that they was going to entrap a bunch of weak-minded people by selling them guns, high-powered, high-magazine-powered automatic assault rifles, and then turning around and busting them for the very thing that they entrapped them with. We as a society are going to have to wake up in these brutal, evil, demonic, unethical, illegal movements or, or, or tactics that law enforcement to this day is still playing a part of. And if they're not playing a part of it in one way, they're playing a part of it in another way. Because just like the Windmill Ministries being attacked by Homeland Security in 1989 down in Jackson, Tennessee in Madison County by confiscating one of its primary symbolical tools which was a sword symbolizing peace on earth knowing that they was violating my Christian ethical moral rights. And now it has put us where we are today looking down the barrels of a coronavirus and all the hostility that we have been facing off on by seeing this again and again and again and again and again right here in the good old USA. Good luck to all of us. That is our motto at the Windmill Ministries and will continue to be our motto until we finally, finally get the attention of the American people. Shalom. And God bless America.